Musa Paradisica. This is a Cavendish. Many, many, many different varieties. Plantano, banana, or as we commonly know it as, the banana. This sweet little treat is nature's delicious little snack. It comes in its own packaging. The packaging is biodegradable. It gives you lots of energy, replenishes your muscles. <sighs> this is a marvel of nature's engineering. But who could have known that this perfectly engineered little treat would be the catalyst for the U.S. government to invade and topple democracies, massacre thousands of people, and subjugate most of Central America and some of South America? So let's start from the beginning. Before we get started with how the United States completely wrecked Latin America and set them back decades, we need to understand a couple of the foreign policies that the U.S. had in place. The first one being the Monroe Doctrine. Mm -hmm. This pretty much was like the U.S. marking its territory warning Europe to disinvest their interests in the Americas, mm -hmm. but this policy didn't have much of a bite. It was a whole lot of smoke, but not a lot of fire. Then came along Theodore Teddy Roosevelt. Now this guy wanted all the smoke. He said to walk softly and carry a big stick, and he did by adding to the Monroe Doctrine something called the Roosevelt Corollary. Now these corollaries did two things. First, they gave the U.S. the right to defend Latin America against European colonization or against any Europeans coming over here to collect debts. Next, it gave the U.S. the right to invade any Latin American country that they thought was unstable. These two doctrines really freed up the United States to do whatever the heck they wants to do in this hemisphere. So by the end of the 20th century, the U.S. invaded Latin America over 35 times. This is to protect the interests of multinational corporations, to protect the interests of the U.S. And occasionally, they even helped the country in question. Thank you for joining us today, and a special thank you to our patrons for making this video possible. And the opportunity to bring content like this to the public. Thank you. If you'd like to join our Patreon community, check the link below. You get access to exclusive content, discounts, and free digital downloads. So today, we're going to examine a couple of countries where the U.S. involvement set these countries back and caused massive carnage. The year is 1871 and life is exciting. In the next 10 years, the phonograph, telephone, and light bulb will be invented. The U.S. just built the transatlantic railroad connecting the east to the west. Peru, Chile, Panama all had railroads constructed and the coffee barons of Costa Rica wanted in on the action. They wanted to build a railroad connecting their central valley over to the Caribbean port of Limon so they can make bank by sending their golden crop off to Europe. So they secure contracts to have a railroad built. So this ambitious American business owner named Meyer C. Keith was the one to take over the contracts and the construction of this railroad, but boy, he didn't know what he was getting himself into. Just as they were starting to build like the first 25 miles, they lost 4,000 people, including three of Keith's brothers to malaria, yellow fever, dysentery. The terrain, the diseases was just too much to bear. My name is Minor C. Keith, and them doggone coffee barons and the entire country of Costa Rica defaulted on their loans to me, so the construction of this railroad has come to a stop. Those 4,000 employees and my dearly beloved brothers have died for no reason. This was entirely unacceptable to me. So I took it upon myself to renegotiate the terms of the contract between Costa Rica and their lenders and got their percentage points dropped by five. For services rendered, I renegotiated my contract with Costa Rica and I acquired 800,000 acres of land. 6% of Costa Rica belonged to me. And I also took control of their railroad for 99 years. All legal, all by contract, all mine. Miner C. Keith took those 800,000 acres of land and decided to invest in a different golden cash crop, the banana. He continued to expand his business to Colombia and to Panama. He had controlling interests in the South. There was a big player in Boston, the Boston Fruit Company, who cornered the market in the North 
So we have a power player in the north, a power player in the south. Because of various different business interests, these guys got together and formed the American multinational super company, the United, United Fruit company. company, also known as El Grupo. Because they had their tentacles in everything. Land. Sea. And air. The coup will be broadcasted. This is a business with very tight margins. We're talking very narrow. If you don't have control of your margins, you don't have a business. And the United Fruit Company was big business. When I say big business, United Fruit Company owned property or leased property in Honduras, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Cuba, Jamaica, all of Central America, some of the West Indies, and a lot of South America. The United Fruit Company owned plantations in all of these countries and their conditions for their workers were absolutely deplorable. It was the bare minimum to get by. They owned the barracks, but the barracks had infrequently running water and electricity. They owned the food store, the commissary, and they paid their workers by way of, we'll call them uh, fruit stamps. In other words, they got paid with certificates that they could only use in the commissary on most plantations. Workers were paid on a piece work basis. In other words, day labor. No contract, no mandatory minimums, none of that kind of stuff. This allowed the United Fruit Company to skirt tax laws and social security. This is indicative of the general working conditions at the United Fruit Company. And this is really exemplified in Colombia. In Colombia, there was an event that is now known as the Banana Massacre. This took place in 1928 in the city of Cienaga, Colombia. Banana workers went on strike on November 12th and they were demanding some ridiculous things like dignified working conditions. An eight hour work day. A six day work week. And to be paid with money. As opposed to fruit stamps. But the United Fruit Company, they weren't negotiating at all. Instead, they contacted their private army, AKA the United States government, and characterized the workers as communists. So Big Brother then called the Colombian army and pretty much said, we have a US Marine Corps ship sitting off of the coast of Cienaga right now. And if you don't go in there and protect our interests, the United Fruit Company, then we will. So, the Colombian government decided to handle the issue. They contacted their army battalion out of the Bogota area. Those guys came into the city, locked off the city streets, stationed machine guns on the rooftops of businesses on the corners, and proceeded to massacre the city right after Sunday nights. Unfortunately, the bodies were discarded in an indiscriminate manner no one knows the number of people that were actually killed, but it's suspected to be in the thousands. And to this day, that city still commemorates yearly the tragedy that happened there, all while the United Fruit Company still operates in the area under a different name. Colombian citizens are suing Chiquita Brand in federal court for allegedly paying death squads to murder 677 of their family members, according to the courthouse news. The plaintiffs allege that the company hired the hit squads in order to protect its banana plantations in the country. This wasn't the first time, or will it be the last time, that the United Fruit Company will receive assistance from the United States government. Their production schedule wasn't harmed, nor were their profits. $44 million in 1953. That's an insane amount of money. Enough to buy countries, enough to buy militaries, enough to pay off the U.S. This story is layered. There are a lot of connections between the United Fruit Company and the U.S. government, specifically the Eisenhower administration. So let's run down the list. The Secretary of State was John Foster Dulles, and his brother, Alan Dulles, was the director of the CIA. Both brothers worked for the law firm that represented the United Fruit Company. Both brothers sat on the board for United Fruit Company, and both brothers owned shares in the company. Now, United Fruit Company's PR officer was married to Eisenhower's private secretary. And there's more. The U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Henry Cabot Lodge, had personal stock holdings in United Fruit Company. The Assistant Secretary of State, John Lodge, had personal stock holdings in United Fruit Company. The Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, his law firm uh, did legal work for, I believe it's the Schlafly Bank, which held the papers on the Guatemalan Railroad, which was owned by the United Fruit Company. 
and the CIA director, Alan Dulles, was his brother, also was a member of the same law firm with this indirect financial interest in United Fruit Company. It seems like almost everyone was trying to get a piece of United Fruit Company profits. The story of Guatemala goes something like this. The dictators and the executive class of Guatemala extended an ominous invitation to the United Fruit Company to come into their country and operate their post office. Now at this juncture in time, the world and everyone in Central America knew who and what the United Fruit Company was. So they knew who they were opening their door to. Oddly enough, three years later, the United Fruit Company was granted exclusive rights to build and operate the railroad of Guatemala. And this is the beginning of the takeover. So the United Fruit Company proceeds to do what they do in other Latin American countries. But let's fast forward a few decades to the administration of dictator Jorge Ubico. Under his reign, United Fruit Company acquired 42% of Guatemala's land, and they got it tax-free. The wheels were greased to cause the United Fruit Company to begin their business, and they are in the business of taking over, and that's exactly what they did. Land, sea, and air. They built the railroad, they set up worker camps, yeah. they set up plantations, and they started raking in the profits. Now, this isn't the end of it, but there was the Guatemala Revolution of 1944. Woohoo! Guatemala! Freedom! <laughs> President Ubico resigns, and a young democracy begins to take shape. One democratically elected president reigns, and it's a beautiful reign. Another is elected. And this is where the United States asserts itself and decides to topple a democracy in the name of corporate profits. Second term, another guy is elected for the people and of the people. This guy is Colonel Jacobo Arbenz. Mm-hmm, Arbenz. And he had, you know, the kind of like Robin Hood vibe going mm -hmm. on. And mm -hmm. he's like, this isn't right. 90% of the population here is made up of landless farmers. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to redistribute some of this land because not only does United Fruit Company own 42% of farmable land, but they're not even using all of it. President Arbenz created Decree 99, which redistributed the unused land to landless farmers. So he expropriated the land, meaning he took it, but he paid for it. He bought the land and he paid United Fruit Company what they said the land was worth according to their taxes. But of course, they were unhappy with this because they understated the value of the land to avoid tax burdens. United Fruit Company didn't like this. They did, so they ran and told you know who. The United Fruit Company's trigger to activate their private army was communism. And they would squeeze this trigger again and again and again. America was in the grips of a long internal war known as the Red Scare. They saw communists everywhere. This lasted from 1919 to about the mid-1970s. The United States ruling class lived in fear of their American version of capitalism being usurped by communism. And they lathered the American citizens up into a furious paranoia. Citizens were given hotlines and encouraged to spy on one another. In recognizing a communist, physical appearance counts for nothing. If he openly declares himself to be a communist, we take his word for it. If a person consistently reads and advocates the views expressed in a communist publication, he may be a communist. If a person supports organizations which reflect communist teachings or organizations labeled communist by the Department of Justice, she may be a communist. This went so deep that the FBI went after suspected communists and communist sympathizers. They bugged phones and they even had a policy for their field agents where those agents had to have at least seven informants informing on the black community because obviously black people are communists. But this was the climate of the era, panic and paranoia. So Eisenhower did not want to get directly involved, so he worked behind the scenes with the mm -hmm. Central Intelligence like, Agency. Yay. 
Handle that, please. Handle that. Now, these guys have a lot of experience in this in this area. They've overthrown many governments in the past, and they know exactly what to do. So the whole role of the CIA at this point was to try to overthrow President Arvins. Mm -hmm. The experience that they have is finding people who they can put in positions of power to invade and do just that. They hired an ex-Arvins officer, backed him, mm -hmm. and proceeded to do a propaganda campaign like you would not believe. This smear campaign was intense. The CIA went as far as to hire two DJs and one actor to create a fake national news radio show. The CIA pulled together a rebel army putting a disaffected Guatemalan army officer at the helm, Castillo Armas, and of course he was an anti arben supporter. He was in charge of 200 people, although the fake news radio show inflated the numbers saying that they couldn't confirm or deny whether he had a battalion of 5,000 men. This fake news radio show actually had their broadcasts from a shack in Nicaragua. But with these resources at their disposal, they blasted the Guatemalan people with lots of disinformation, warning that an impending civil war was on its way to the capital. There are mass casualties. There are soldiers defecting from the army, refugees fleeing from the country. And they were imploring the citizens of Guatemala telling them that the only way to stop this impending war was to abandon their support of the president. And they did. And then the violence started. That officer, his name was Carlos Castillo Armas, and he, with the backing of the US government and the CIA, mm -hmm. invaded Guatemala. Dropped bombs on Guatemala City, and eventually upseated this president, and then inserted their puppet president. And this was the catalyst that steamrolled this country into a 36 year long, bloody civil war. There will be prosperity for the people, together with liberty for the people. Greed, nepotism, and scandal played their part in this chapter of this story. But this is history. This is real life. There are a lot more of these stories that we would love to tell, so let us know in the comments what you thought about this one and if you'd like to see more. Mm -hmm. Because as we travel through these places, we're seeing history come to life. So look, give us a thumbs up if you guys enjoyed today's broadcast. And again, hit that subscribe button if you have not subscribed, and we'll see you guys in the next broadcast. To those rails of thrumming All aboard To get on the A train Soon you will be on Chippewa Hill in Harlem